for today. Okay, Sabrina Ferrer. Hi, Fred. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Uh, thanks for being willing to speak to us today about your experience of this current moment and the, the significant events of this past year and also to just witness for us what was most significant to you about um, this sort of shared experience with 2020. Um, so if I can just invite you to do anything right now would be to share with us what has been significant to you this year? What's foremost on your mind? Well, the most significant is uh surviving this whole virus thing uh and basically i've been totally locked down for five months uh luckily i have you know a five stories plus basement plus roof building so i have a big building uh and i've been uh, occupied in uh, sort of getting things set up i mean I moved here. I've owned the building for 40 years, uh, but I moved here full time about a year and a half ago from my studio of 50 years in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's been occupied, just sort of getting everything organized, uh, finishing taxes, finishing this, finishing that, getting set up, getting uh, machinery and everything set from California to here to begin work. Uh, I just got my main casting machine here last week. I just a half an hour ago ordered a batch of resin to start making some new pieces for the first time in almost two years. Um, and um, uh, following the whole action of uh, the uh, medical situation and how it's affecting uh everything i mean uh it uh and i'm lucky in that i i'm in new york it's i've gone from the very worst situation in the whole america to the very best situation in the, all of america mm -hmm. uh, i followed that closely like every single day mm -hmm. um and uh i'm witnessing how it's also causing social breakdown. I mean, uh, more murders, more breaking into stores, more this, more that, which is too damn bad. Um, it, you know, I mean, it is the most drastic thing that's happened to this country, certainly in my lifetime, probably the most drastic thing that happened since 1918. Um, and it's having a profound influence on the entire art world, me, uh, everyone I know, um, and um, trying to figure out how to deal with this entire new environment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was scheduled to be go down in Washington. I was scheduled to go back to California. Uh, you know, I mean, I do everything myself, my own plumbing, my own everything, uh, because uh, I don't want people in here, uh, particularly. And uh, I see very few free people, a few friends, uh, and even that's at uh, social distancing and with masks and things. Um, the only person I interact with closely is my wife. Um, and uh luckily she's right here uh working full time setting helping me set up the building uh has planted a large garden on the roof that occupies a lot of her time and is getting into making some art herself um and so it's a very strange thing not going to openings not going to museums uh not going to galleries um dealing with uh, well, meetings like this, Zoom meetings. I had one major meeting with about 40 people, uh, my fraternity brothers from college, uh, about a month and a half ago. And then some other meetings uh, with friends of mine in Europe. I call Europe almost four times a week. I have friends everywhere. 
um, and calling them out around America every week uh, to friends uh, and family. Um, so it's a very different kind of environment. Um, and I don't know where it ends. I mean, uh, I think we're under the worst uh, government possible for this kind of a, a situation. Um, uh, I think Trump is the most destructive person. And I know him, I've met him, I, you know. Uh, he's the most destructive person possible for the job. Uh, I don't know, I have very bad feelings how this is all gonna end. Uh, perhaps, um, perhaps, you know, out of a miracle, we'll pull it off. I have very big doubts. I mean, uh, I watched the, uh, uh, last night I watched, uh, I've been watching the convention, the Democratic convention. Uh, I know a lot of the people, I, I know Biden, I know Clinton, I know all these people for years and years and years. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, that whole crowd can get together and alter uh, the whole possibility of, you know, this country ever coming back together again. Uh, but I have my doubts. Um, Anyway, so that's what I've been dealing with. Um, and I spend a couple hours a day at least dealing with that. Um, and um, so, I mean, I finally decided to I would just start doing work, new work here, um, which is, uh, I just, literally 15 minutes ago, ordered a big batch of resin to make some new pieces, literally 15 minutes ago. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, I mean, my history with the Smithsonian uh, is sort of very complicated in a way. I mean, it started probably, I guess, in about 1972 uh, or 71, when the, uh, at the National Museum of American Art uh, bought a piece of mine uh, for inclusion in a show of uh, young American artists that traveled all over the world. There used to be an agency that no longer exists called the uh, United States Information Agency, which is basically a foreign propaganda thing. And my little piece that was bought by Joshua Taylor, the director of uh, the National Museum of American Art, it's called the National Collection of Fine Arts in those days, uh, traveled all over the world. And I have a lot of their documentation and such. And, uh, and then uh, they actually bought a piece for their collection. Uh, in the uh, mid 70s. Uh, and then in 1977, I got appointed as the first artist in residence in the history of the Smithsonian. Mm. Uh, and I did that for three years. I was basically had a large studio in the basement of the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, and uh, I was nominated for that position by Steve Weil, who had been the deputy director of the Whitney Museum and had just become the deputy director of the Hirshhorn Museum. Uh, and uh, so I did that for three years, spent three years in DC, getting to know DC extremely well. Had uh, shows at the National, I mean, I had shows at the Smithsonian but also shows at the National Academy of Sciences, two shows. Uh, one show at the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, one show at the headquarters for the American Institute of Architects, close to the White House. Uh, 
and uh, Jimmy Carter was the president at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I did some favors. I mean, it's, it's a crazy thing. I was able to do a lot of favors for the White House. And in return, the White House uh, had me over for parties and things like that. Uh, gave me the, uh, uh, the, the presidential box for the National Opera a couple of times. Uh, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of funny stories. I mean, people thought I was Hamilton Jordan, of all people, right? And because uh, uh, we were about the same age and the same height and such. Mm. Um, and um, so I spent three serious years with, in Washington, and then two more years of commuting to Washington rather often because my girlfriend who I obtained sort of when I, while I was in Washington became uh, head of the Institute for Museum Services. Uh, and uh, uh, which was in a, a fairly major job. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I would go down and uh, spend weekends with her and she'd come up and spend weekends with me here in New York. I bought New York, my, this building I have in New York, during that time, basically to allow us to have uh, a place in New York together. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did that until about 83 when we broke up, uh, but I still have the building. And now all these years later, I'm using it full time. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I mean, I can go on and on and on. I'm yeah. still in contact with some people at the Smithsonian. Um, Alan Oberg was the uh, Associate General Counsel of the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. And I speak to him fairly often. Uh, uh, he's now retired, but still very active in the DC area. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I could go on forever about my connections with the Smithsonian and yeah. DC. Um, well, I, I'm listening to the timeline of your career and you know this is this is hardly the only you know historic historic and significant moment that you lived through and you know been practicing through right um and yet i'm, I'm that was a period of from basically from mm -hmm. 77 to 83 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot in washington uh at least half time in washington at the smithsonian and around the smithsonian Mm -hmm. uh, since then, I've been in California as my primary, primary thing. I have New York. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in Europe mm -hmm. doing uh, commissions in Europe, uh, commissions in the Mideast. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and using New York basically as a, uh, a, a couple months a year base. Mm -hmm. uh, on the way back and forth from California to Europe and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of uh, current history, uh, I finally got evicted, basically, out of my studio of 50 years in California. Because uh, uh, they wanted to rent to a commercial establishment for a lot more money than an artist can pay. Uh, and so I moved back here full time and just uh, been fixing this place up and getting it ready to do work. Uh, when all of this crazy um, situation with the uh, Corona mm -hmm. hit. Uh, and um, so now I'm essentially full time in New York. Mm -hmm. um, Uh, and I'm probably, I'm, I'm probably going to go back full time and making just small plastic pieces of sculpture as opposed to some of the large commissions, the large commissions in front of the Miami airport mm -hmm. and at the San Francisco airport. I mean, uh, I did large commissions all over the world, mm -hmm. 40 feet tall, 30 feet tall. Uh, and, um, Yeah, and I, I've been sitting here watching uh, America go through its great, greatest crises 
in my lifetime. I mean, uh, I was involved in the civil rights movement uh, in the 70s, mostly. Uh, I was actually in Europe the whole time of the Watts riots. Mm -hmm. I arrived back to a town halfway destroyed by the Watts riots. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a graduate engineer. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, uh, my first three, I went to Brooklyn Technical High School here and then uh, Carnegie Mellon University in, in Pittsburgh. I was the first black person at the university. Uh, I was the big experiment. <laughs> uh and um uh and then from there i went out to california ostensibly for six months uh to work for an engineering company that was owned by uh, one of my fraternity brother's father um and the vietnam war kept getting worse and worse and worse and my job which was basically building the major laboratories, acoustical laboratories in NASA Houston, uh, kept me out of, uh, out of the army, kept me out of the draft. And then I had an automobile accident that immediately kept me out of the draft the rest of my life. Mm. I retired from engineering. Mm. Uh, I was living in Venice, California, surrounded by all the artists and all the jazz people and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just started making art. And I had fairly, I mean, good success. I was having shows uh, three months after I started making art. Mm. Uh, and uh, this kind of culminated in a one-man show at the Whitney Museum. Uh, I guess uh, two years after I started making art. Mm. Uh, and then followed by gallery shows in, the sh uh, in Chicago and Kansas City and San Francisco and uh so I, that's what i've been doing the last 50 years basically is making art and making sculpture having shows doing big commissions mm -hmm. um and uh you know, i've watched in terms of racial progress i've watched america go through all kinds of uh fits and starts i mean from the watts riots in l.a uh through uh, things getting much, much better. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I was lucky in a way in that I was living in Venice, California, on the beach, which is surrounded by artists, uh, 20 miles away from the ghetto, from Watts and such. Uh, and so I knew of it. I went down there. I had a couple of friends living down there, but I wasn't full time down there, subjected to all of the bullshit that happens. Uh, and in New York, I live in Soho. Uh, again, at, the, at one time when I first moved here, there was a fair number of minority artists uh that you know basically over the time either died or moved away uh most of them died actually mm -hmm. over the years um and uh so i had not been as subject i mean I, I had a crazy career i integrated the first hotel in the state of texas <laughs> you know uh oh. July 1st, 1963, on my way to Mexico, on my way to California for my engineering job. It was by accident, but I did integrate the Alamo Motel in San Antonio in 63. And then I got, my first commission was a commission for Ray Hunt for his hotel, the hotel that John Kennedy was assassinated in front of. Uh, I did my first large uh, fountain uh and so i have this uh i've had great experiences in texas although texas is for the most part a fairly segregated state uh it didn't affect me i mean i was in building the laboratory the 
laboratories at NASA Houston, uh, unknown to me, actually unknown to me, the FBI had arranged with Hertz Corporation that I had the only Mustang in the state of Texas. Uh, it was a red Mustang and every cop knew who I was. I had no idea about this. I mean, to the very end almost. Uh, so, I mean, I speeded everywhere I went. I did this, I did that. I mean, no one ever did anything uh, because I had this important job. Um, and so I worked uh, three days a week. I, for the most part, worked 12 hours a day. I come home and eat in the hotel I was staying at, right next to NASA. And then I go back to LA on the weekend. And I had no idea of what the state was, really. Uh, and even since then, I mean, my experiences in Texas have been pretty good because I was an artist. I existed in that funny little art world. Uh, and uh, actually, I had, I mean, I integrated the. Uh, literally the grand opening of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston by accident uh, because the woman who was head of PR fucked up and invited me. Uh, and uh, I didn't realize I was the only black person until I walked into an opening of 6,000 people and I was the only black person except for the waiters, right? Yeah. Uh, and even though I've only planned to stay a day, I ended up staying a week to go to everything, every single thing, because uh, I felt it was important that I show my face. Um, and I mean, I, I could go on for hours about this kind of thing. Um, and uh, the same thing, I mean, Chicago's falling apart right now. Uh, but my experiences in Chicago happened to be very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just the right time at the right place uh, and uh, in the right crowd of people. Uh, so my experiences, I mean, the only black artist I ever got to know in Chicago was Richard Hunt. Um, he's the only one I got to know well. The only black artist I got to know well in D.C. was Sam Gilliam, who lived up the street for me. Um, and uh, here in New York, there were several black artists who lived in the neighborhood. Uh, one by one, they died off or moved. <laughs> um, so I think I'm the only black artist left just about in the neighborhood. I mean, uh, Crystal, who I knew very well, uh, he lives right across the street and he died a month ago. So, I mean, there are very few artists left in Soho. Um, and uh, Soho right now is a ghost town in that most of the businesses haven't reopened. Uh, so I'm looking out the window and looking at the big buildings across the street and they're fairly empty, almost, you know. Um, and um, the, um, I have no idea what's going to happen here. Mm. Um, right now, for me, it's fine, but I, I have no idea of the future. Mm. Um, and I mean, most of the trouble, most of the uh, unrest, most of the killings and everything happened in Brooklyn, which is where I was born and raised. Uh, um, but I haven't lived in Brooklyn since 1959, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, what I've seen in terms of uh, the stuff that happened in Minneapolis and such, uh, I was actually fairly shocked because Minneapolis is the town I happen to know. Uh, the Walker is the big museum in Minneapolis. Berta Walker, whose family built it, is a friend of mine. She worked at the Whitney Museum when I had my show there. Uh, she now has a gallery in Provincetown. Uh, so I used to go to the Walker with Berta 
in the 70s. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, Minneapolis was a very liberal, fairly wide open town as far as I could see. I mean, I never had, I gave lectures at the university. Uh, I was in and out many times. I never had a single problem. I stayed in normal hotels right downtown. Um, but obviously, unbeknownst to me almost, there was a black girl that I didn't know about, I never saw, uh, where things were not as sweet as they were that I experienced. Um, but again, I don't think it was anywhere as bad, even in the black ghetto back then, as it is now. Um, so I was shocked when the whole thing went down in Minneapolis, really shocked. Uh, and I called Berta, who's now, whatever, almost 90 years old, living in, in Provincetown, and had a long talk with her about it. She was shocked. Um, I haven't, well, I, it's a virus, so I haven't been anywhere. But I mean, um, and now there's trouble in Chicago. Chicago's a town I spent an enormous amount of time in. I've had so many shows in Chicago. Um, uh, again, I never had one piece of trouble in Chicago. Uh, but obviously, there is a problem in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, I mean, well, I mean, the virus and the fact that I'm uh, 78 years old and I'm, you know, susceptible to uh, a very bad situation, so I keep locked down. But the virus, um, prevents me from going around basically to Chicago or Minneapolis or any of these places um, and seeing with my own eyes or perhaps getting involved, uh, trying to get some of these things settled. Um, uh, so I'm in this very funny situation that I am very well aware of what's happening in America. Uh, what's happening in America has a lot of to do with who's president and, and such and, and, and the makeup of the Congress. Uh, I mean, in Washington, I mean, I've been in the White House maybe 15 times when Jimmy Carter was the president. Uh, and now I watch what's happening and I am shocked. It's so different from everything I observed, every, and I, I speak to people. I mean, I speak to people at the Smithsonian. I speak to people like Marianne Goley, who used to be head of uh, art for the Federal Reserve Board. Mm -hmm. uh, I speak to a lot of people, uh, still Alan Oberg, who's, you know, uh, uh, was a general cat. I mean, he really helped me out. And I used to spend a lot of time with he and his wife in Maryland on the way to uh, go crabbing and stuff. Um, and America's changed to the better in a lot of ways. But right now, America is in a enormous crisis, like worse than I've ever experienced in my lifetime. Uh, and I just hope and pray that uh, Trump gets thrown out and that Biden uh, becomes the president and turns this thing around. Otherwise, I mean, well, I honestly God, don't know. I mean, I don't know uh, in terms of myself what I can do. My wife is Swedish. So, I mean, I could always go live in Sweden. Um, uh, it's a very funny situation to be in. Um, 
one of my collectors, a, a black guy, who's the vice chairman of Citibank, I just saw in the LA, New York Times, uh, is speaking about running for mayor. Uh, the last time I saw him was literally just the week before this whole thing, the whole virus thing came about. Um, he owns two of my pieces. Uh, um, I think he's crazy to want to be mayor, but I support him in a, in a minute. Um, so that is two days, that's literally two days ago, that whole thing uh, came, was announced in the New York Times. Mm. Um, so I haven't had a chance to call him yet. Um, I think America is at a crossroads uh, that could go either way, either get much worse or better. Wow. I feel like, I mean, that's a, a powerful way to sort of end this interview, but I'm just wondering if there's anything I have, you, know, you would like to leave here as, as the last thought, this idea that we're at the crossroads. Um, I'm, I'm, all the listening to you, I keep, I can't help but wonder what is, what do you see that is possible now that maybe was unimaginable before, right? What is, what do you, you know, I'm hearing all of this, I don't know what will happen, which is what everyone's feeling, but, um, but we rarely articulate, what are we worried? What do we suddenly think is possible that maybe was completely unthinkable, right? This time well, last year. I think that, you know, uh, the scientists, the doctors and such, mm -hmm. we eventually get a handle on the, the pandemic. Um, what I don't know, in terms of America, does it become a dictatorship run by Trump, or do we get back onto a fairly even keel uh, on the Biden? That is what I do not know. And for the next two nights, I'll be eight hours, I mean, I'll be uh, watching. Uh, but I mean, I think things are never, that the country is at a crossroads that's more dangerous in every way I know, health-wise, politically, security-wise, everything, than it's ever been in my lifetime. And uh, that's what I feel. Mm. Um, and I'm not smart enough to fully understand. I mean, it, it'll all come out in the next three months, right? Mm. By Christmas, it will be out one way or the other. Uh, and um, there isn't very much that I, as an individual, can do other than, you know, be supportive and uh, uh, give some money and blah, blah, blah. There's not very much I can do. I've never felt more helpless. Uh, about uh, being able to influence the situation. Uh, I've watched people that I know very well, Bill, Bill Clinton last night and such. Uh, I know him very well. I, I said many people I know very well. Uh, and Al Sharpton, people like that, right? Uh, And I'm hoping that they manage to uh, be effective uh, in uh, changing the situation. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this country uh, does have a racist background. Uh, and it really could go either way. It really could go either way. 
And I'm just extremely lucky that maybe that I came along when I came along, uh, which is probably the best time for me to ever come along in the history of this country. Um, because I do not have full confidence that things will get better in my lifetime. Well, I do not have, I wish I did, but I don't. That is a powerful statement. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's quite powerful to say that you feel lucky to have come along. No, I mean, I, I've been extremely lucky. Yeah. Uh, I don't know very mm -hmm. many people who've been luckier than me, mm -hmm. black, white, or purple. Mm -hmm. I don't know very many people uh, that have had more freedom, more success, more anything. Uh, you know, with me in college, in my engineering job as an artist, mm -hmm. I know. I mean, I know very few people mm -hmm. who've had it as good as I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I recognize how good, basically, I have. It. I've had it. Uh, and uh, I'm watching literally everything fall apart. You know, I'm watching Europe fall apart. Mm -hmm. Not as bad as America, but I'm watching it fall apart. I'm watching uh, this disease ravaging South America. I mean, I know Brazil. I had great times in Brazil. Right now, Brazil is horrible. Uh, and, you know, will be horrible as long as I'm alive, I'm sure. Um, I know South America, I know Africa, I know the Middle East. I've had great experiences, I mean, wonderful experiences. And I think no matter what happens with the virus, that uh, those experiences cannot be recreated, at least in my lifetime, maybe never. You know, I mean, there's so much bitterness, so much everything uh, that I don't know if uh, the world could ever be as good as when, I mean, I came along right at the right time after World War II, basically, and then up until recently, when things really fell apart, uh, politically, health-wise, all kinds of ways. And uh, so when I look at it objectively, I have to consider myself incredibly lucky. Wow. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I came from nice, well-educated parents mm -hmm. uh, who lived a very good, very good lives themselves. Uh, and uh, uh, what can I say? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a crazy time. Mm -hmm. and you keep hoping that things are going to get better, and maybe they will. Uh, maybe they will. Right. I hope they will. Mm -hmm. Well, Fred, thank you so much. Um, okay. We really appreciate uh, that you were able to find the time to talk to us today. This is incredibly valuable. I really appreciate it personally, and I know everyone else will as well. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Take Bye. care and be safe. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.